I'm good with that. Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody? Anybody notice when I was gone? No. No, nobody misses me. Oh, Yeah, a good trip. Oh, it was cold. It was cold. Where I was, it was 20 degrees. 20. It was, it was very cold. We were in Dallas. We were uh, visiting family for a couple weeks, but we are back. And we're going to open to the book of John. I want you to turn to John chapter 7 this morning. John chapter 7. And the book of John keeps getting better. We're actually going to finish out chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles on the table for everybody. John is in the New Testament towards the end of the book there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And we catch up with Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. And in John chapter 7 at verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival... Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet, is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. 45. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Then they all went home. Lord, we thank you for your word. We invite you to teach us. We ask, Lord, that you would speak your word and guide us. And Lord, I pray that your invitation to anyone who thirsts would ring out in our ears and in our hearts today that anyone who thirsts would come to you and drink and find satisfaction for the soul and that we would find it true that whoever believes in you rivers of living water would flow from within us and we pray for this and we ask you to teach us in Jesus name amen Do you know what it feels like to thirst? I mean, have you had one of those days where you just can't possibly get enough water? Where you just feel a need from within you, I need to drink water. I need to drink water. Like your body desperately needs to get some water in there or you're going to die. Do you know what it feels like to thirst and there's just no water around? You ever go to a water fountain and you're like, oh, I really need this, and there's just nothing. There's just, or some kid has stuck gum in it. That's the worst. And it just sprays you in the eye, and you're like, I'm not drinking that. <laughs> I don't care how thirsty I am. <laughs> but do you know what it feels like to need water? Like desert winds roll in, Santa Ana's, and you just crave water. We had some Santa Ana's a couple weeks ago, and it was dry, and I was just walking around the house like, I gotta go drink more water. I just need to go drink more water. Your body needs it. What's going on there is your body literally needs it. It's not just a desire like, oh, I could go for some water. That'd be enjoyable and refreshing right now. Your body is telling you, you must drink water or you will die. I don't mean like the Kobe Bryant, obey your thirst and go drink a Sprite. 
That's not the same thing. If you obey your thirst, you don't drink a Sprite. I don't know if you figured that out yet, but that's actually a really bad idea if you are genuinely thirsty. If you just want a little, you know, sugar treat, all right, fine. But your thirst wants water. Second question, have you ever gone through a dry season in life where you feel dry and thirsty, but we're not talking about water this time? Have you gone through a time where you just like, your soul's missing something, and you just feel dry? And it's not about water, it's definitely not about a soda, but you need something. A rough patch, a time that just feels like you're wandering through the desert. I mean, even when you're walking with God. Now, for some of us, we remember before we knew God, when our soul just needed something, and you finally found God, you felt satisfied. But I'm talking also about walking with the Lord, knowing Jesus, having gone through the experience of, like, Jesus satisfies my thirst, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and you just hit a dry season. I want to tell you that that is one of the most important times in your walk with God. That that season has something for you. That it didn't happen by accident. That God will lead you into the desert. Did you know that? Did you know that God will lead you right out into the desert? That you're following God and you end up in the driest place on the planet and think, I must have got this wrong. But God will lead you. Did you know that God leads you in the desert? Do you know that, that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert, out in the desert, where there was no food, just rocks, no bread, where there's no water for him. The Holy Spirit led him. Did you know that God led all of the Israelites in the Old Testament out into the desert? With the promised land a little bit farther, but first there was the desert. Well, actually, that was one of the most important times in Israel's journey, so important that God told the Israelites, never forget this. In fact, once a year, they were called to have a feast. Now, there were seven feasts during the year, all of them really important, as they would come together and remember different things. You remember Passover. They, what did they remember at Passover? They'd all get together. That they were passed over. They remember the rescue from Egypt when they were slaves and God freed them from slavery. And they were rescued from the angel of death. They were passed over by the angel of death by the blood of a lamb. But they had more feasts during the year. They had Pentecost. They had the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is what is being celebrated here. If you look at the beginning of John chapter 7. Go back to the beginning. Give a little context. This whole chapter happens during this thing called the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, if you look, if you got an NIV and it has a little title at the top of it, it says, Jesus goes to the Feast of Tabernacles. That's not in the original Bible, but somebody wanted to help you out by telling you, hey, this is what's going to happen here so you don't miss the big stuff. But look, it says in verse 2, But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. What they're talking about is everybody is going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It was an annual feast. It was law. Everybody who lived within like 15 miles or so of Jerusalem, they had to go. Everybody else was invited to go. But pretty much everybody wanted to go because this was the joyful feast. It was known among the Jews as the feast. It was generally the happiest time of the year. This was like Christmas and New Year's. This was like everybody gathering together for Thanksgiving. This was everybody, and it was in the fall, it was like a harvest festival, but it was time to gather for celebration. Now, here's what would happen. Now, those of you wondering why on earth we have a tent over here and who might have been camped out, and it was, it's actually my tent. Now, no, I was not so excited that I camped here overnight, although I do get excited for church. Saturday night's exciting because I got church coming up, but there's a reason. So here's what happens at Feast of Tabernacles. The word tabernacle there really just means tent. Tabernacle, we think of like the temple, but the word tabernacle just meant tent. In the Old Testament, they built a tabernacle for God. It was a temple, but really it was just God's tent. It was a portable temple. And the Feast of Tabernacles really in in Hebrew just means Feast of Tabernacles tents or booths. It's also called the Feast of Booths. And what the the Jews would do is once a year for a week in the fall, they would all 
leave their houses, gather at Jerusalem. Everybody brings a lean-to. Everybody brings a, uh, a makeshift tent and they live in the tent for a week. Outdoors, under the moon and stars, and it's a celebration. And everybody lives in tents. And while they do, they are telling stories to their kids. They're telling stories to their kids about the season. The 40 years when their forefathers lived in the desert, when they followed God. And the stories again and again came back to God's faithfulness. When we were in the desert, there's no food anywhere, but God provided manna that we could eat. We were in the desert and there was no water and it was totally dry. And God told Moses to take his staff and strike the rock and the rock provided water. And day after day and year after year, God provided. And the stories they would tell were not all stories of, they were not all happy stories. Oh, don't put that one up yet. That's for later. <laughs> That's just going to confuse everybody. Thanks. <laughs> like, who are those people? <laughs> okay, that's coming later. They're out in the desert and, uh, and they're remembering, they're telling their kids a story. And God wanted their kids to know the story so that their kids would not lose the hard-earned lessons of their parents. Do you know that's important? That your kids need to know the lessons you learn the hard way. Do you know it's important that your kids know that God saw you through your hardest times in life? Your kids need to know that. That God was faithful to you. And that was the message. They spend a whole week every year telling their kids the story again and again. God got us through. God got us through. Do you know that you learn something from the hardest times in life? That you go through it and it's not wasted if you'll learn something from it. And you want to pass that on to your kids. How often do you remember the hardest times in your life? How often do you look back? Now, for those of you who are in it right now, you're like, not hard to remember. That's not like, let's think back. What was this morning like? Oh, that was hard. <laughs> But they would remember, they'd gather in tents to say, you know what, we all live like this for, for 40 years. This was home. See, when I bring out the tent, some of us look at the tent and, and think nostalgically, yeah, I remember camping with my family, that was great. Some of us look at the tent and remember, I remember when that's all there was. That's home. Those are not happy memories. Understand that for the Israelites, the Feast of Tabernacles was doing this for fun to remember what it was like when this was everything, when that's all they had. They were homeless wandering through the desert, and yet God had promised them a home, and God did not want them to forget that those days had a purpose, that they Although it was rough, although it was living in the desert, although it was not, not the promised land, God was with them. God was with them. You learn something from the hard days. And that's what this festival, all of chapter 7, takes place in that context. Now, I want to dive into it in a second, but I want to give you a chance to talk together. I'm going to give you just four or five minutes here, and I want you to discuss this. What do you learn by remembering the hard days? What do you learn by remembering the hard days? Now, I'll, I'll say this with a, a little, a little uh, addendum here. I realize that some of those hard days, there are some things that you do not want to remember, that you leave those in the past. And that's good, and that's right. There are some things about the, the hard days. Maybe it's your sin. Maybe it's sin done to you. There are things that you leave in the past and you do not bring up again. I'm not talking about that part. I'm talking about with uh, God got you through a little, uh, the hard days. When you didn't know how you're going to pay the rent, or you didn't know if there would even be a rent to pay, but God got you through it. God got you through it. What do you learn from remembering the hard days? So that's my question for you. It was an annual feast, something they had to do all the time, they had to tell their kids, but do you ever actually go through that? When you think back, what lessons do you get from your hard times? Maybe that's last week, maybe that's last year, maybe it's 10 years ago for you. But do you ever think back? And this is actually kind of personal for me. We visited Dallas last, uh, last week. We're visiting family. We've got a great family out there, a bunch of cousins, a bunch of little kids to go have Christmas with. It was great to get together. Um, but as we were there, I was remembering that it was uh, 2012 when we moved, we moved back from the mission field, back from Missy. We were in Dallas. We lived there for two months. And while we were there, we were not houseless, but we were homeless. My family was without home for most of 2012. 
And I remember what wandering the desert was like. We had family, we had friends, we had people to stay with. I'm ever thankful for them. Most of all, I remember God got us through, but I do not forget how hard it was to not have a place to call home. But it's good to not forget because God got us through. God got us through. So, you're discussing me well. Four or five minutes, I remember. What, what do you remember? What do you learn from remembering the hard days, the desert days in your life? That's just kind of, and then we're going to dive in together to just not forget. But it's not But it's not forget. Because God got us through. God got us through. So, you're discussing me for five minutes. What do you remember? Okay, you got another minute and a half. Make sure everybody gets a chance to say something.
All right, time to close it up. That's your timer. All right, turn back to John 7. Turn back to John chapter 7. I want to get the Jeopardy music for this. <laughs> what do you learn from the hard times? What do you take with you? Right, you get uh, one or two words that you back from uh, a couple of tables. I want to hear what you guys came up with. What are some things you learned? Right. Don't tell God you have a big problem. Tell your problem you have a big God. That's good. You want yourself grow in the, in the hard times. It's one thing. Now, we should be growing all the time, but you will see your heart, your faith, your, yourself really grow through the, the hardest step. Uh, anything else you learn? One or, one or two words. What do you learn from the hard times? Think about it. Appreciation. Appreciation for what you have. And, uh, and you hopefully enjoy what God provides for you a whole lot more for having gone without it. And that's worth something. That's worth a lot. You learn the, the choices. You learn One of the things you learn is uh, the choices you make you, that you have some control in your life. Some things you go through and God led you to it. Some things you, you recognize that you brought yourself into it. And interesting that the Israelites were in the, uh, they were in the desert for 40 years, but God's original plan was not 40 years. The, uh, the trek would have taken about 11 days to two weeks if they had just gone straight through it. God's plan for them was about two years in the desert. But then they got to the promised land, and by their own choice, they chickened out. They went back, and they ended up in the desert. For, God still provided for them, but it was not God's plan to keep them in the, the dry time for 40 years. I think you learn humility. I think you learn humility. I think you learn to, to look at others who are going through hard times without the, the judgmentalism, to not judge them by their appearances or their circumstances. And that's actually a big part of our story here. Turn back in John chapter 7. Let's see what's going on. Now, as they're celebrating, I want you guys to picture the scene. If you enter the scene, this story is much more powerful. We're going to get one of the great verses, one of, the, uh, of, of all the, the red letter verses in 737. 737 is bigger than an airplane. It's a big one. And Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty... But if you get the context of what's happening. Now, if you picture the scene there, all of Israel's gathered together. It's a busy place and there's a lot of joy in the place. The people wake up each morning together with their families, get up out of their tents like this. And then during the day, they would celebrate and commemorate and tell the stories of how God saw them through. They would tell the stories of the escape from Egypt, of how Moses led them and, and how God parted the seas. They would tell the stories of following a pillar of cloud by day, that God kept it cool in the desert with his own presence, a, a great big cloud. And then at night, there was a pillar of fire that would keep them all warm. They didn't have to light the fire. God was just there with the fire. It was fantastic. But one of the stories that they would remember each and every day was the story of water coming from the rock. The priests commemorated each day they would take a pitcher. They would take a pitcher and a procession of the priests would walk out of the city through the water gate to a place called the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam, they would gather there and they would fill the pitchers with water and then all of the priests, you got to picture all the priests and all their robes, they're, they're coming back through the city and all the people are following along like a big parade and they're carrying pitchers of water. They end up back in the temple courtyard. In the temple courtyard, they take the water pitchers and they pour out the water. And as the water would pour out, now they did a little different for me. They would actually pour it out on the ground. I can't do that because I have electronics around me and that would be a little bit dangerous. 
<laughs> but day after day, they would pour out the water, and as the water would go onto the courtyard ground, it would flow out among the people. And as the water would, would trickle down between their feet, they would remember the story. Now, the story is in Exodus 17. In the story, the people were out in the desert. It was actually called the Desert of Sin, not because it was a sinful place. That was just the, the name of it. It was not the same in Hebrew. But the Desert of Sin, like we think of the Sinai, Mount Sinai, as they traveled from place to place, it says the people began to quarrel with Moses, and they said to Moses, give us water to drink. Now, you can keep your place in John 7. If you want to turn with me, it's Exodus 17. If you don't want to turn, I'll, I'll tell you the story. But they said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children livestock die of thirst? Now, the people have been following God. They've seen signs of God. God has come through. They, they saw the ten plagues. They saw the waters part. I mean, they, they couldn't miss seeing the waters part. They walked through it on dry ground. They know. They've seen miracles. But now they're thirsty. And realities hit them. And they're, they're, they're saying, how do we end up here? What are we doing here? And people started to say, it was Moses. Moses is the one who told us that God's lead. Moses. And they go to Moses and say, why would you bring us into a desert? What were you thinking? The desert is not a place. Have you ever actually wandered and gone hiking into a desert? It gets hot and dry fast. Really fast. And you start realizing really quickly that you are a baby little city boy. <laughs> that you are, and you're like, where's the water fountain? It's a desert. We, we don't have water fountains here. Didn't you bring a canteen? I've never needed a canteen before. Everywhere I've ever gone in my entire life, water just comes out of metal tubes. And I just turn this thing, and there is water for me. It doesn't work that way in the desert. And they're out in the desert, and they're thinking, there's no water out here. There is no water out here. We're third, and they blame Moses. Moses, what are you doing? Moses is saying, you didn't follow me out here. We followed God out here. But you'll come to those places in life when you think, how did I get here? And you look back and you think, I thought I was following God. I was pretty sure this is where God wants me to be. But where did he go? It says in verse 4 of Exodus 17, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me, as in kill me. The Lord answered Moses, go, in front, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now that question is the heart of the story. The people question, they challenge. He called, it, he called the place quarreling. And he called the place testing, Masa and Meribah. Because the people were out there saying, Is God with us or not? And that's the heart of the question, isn't it? When you're going through the desert, when you're going through a hard time, the real question is not just where am I going to find water? I recognize that's a pressing need. It's not just how am I going to pay my bills? The real question is God with us or not? Because if the Lord is with us, these problems are nothing. My stack of bills is nothing. If the Lord is with us, that hunger in my belly is nothing. This tent I call a house, that means nothing. If God is with me, then who can be against me? But the question they said, is the Lord with us or not? And they challenged God. Now, if you know this story, I want to challenge a little bit your picture of how it actually went down. Because for years, I read this story and I heard this story. And I always pictured Moses out there with his staff. And he just finds like a little boulder. I just kind of picture you like, hit the boulder and then... And, the water, and you get like a water fountain. Everybody gets to drink. But the, there's a problem with that picture of the story because they counted how many people were out in the desert and it's about two or three million people. 
They, they counted the men, it was 600,000, and if you add their families, they got about two or three million people out there with all the kids. How are you going to give water to a couple million people with a little water fountain? I imagine a stadium full of people only has one working water fountain on a really hot day. Santa Ana winds are carrying in, and everybody at Angel Stadium has one work. You know how long the line would be for that water fountain? Now, Angel Stadium holds about 50,000 or so. Multiply that by 40. We have 40 stadiums. And they got one working water fountain. I don't think it worked that way. I want to, I, this part of my, my message here is worthy of a whole teaching, a couple of teachings. But I want to tell you a little story quickly. We met a, uh, a couple in Mississippi. They were actually part of our church in Mississippi. Wonderful couple. Jim Penny Caldwell. Uh, Jim worked for the oil company in Saudi Arabia in the early 90s. And, uh, and he told us a story. Now, they've told the story a lot of places. I could, when I found out their story, I couldn't believe they were in my church. Little tiny church, little town in Mississippi. But wonderful people, fantastic people. Um, and Jim and Penny lived with their kid, little kids in the, the 90s uh, in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is hot desert. Now, the interesting thing about it, they're believers. And, uh, and God said it on their heart one year to, uh, to go visit Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, you know, is the mountain where Moses got the Ten Commandments, where the fire of God came down on the mountain, and, and Mount Sinai is the place. When they were wandering in the desert, that was the main home base. And so they decided they went and visited Mount Sinai. They took a trip, took some vacation time, took a trip to the place where everybody says Mount Sinai. Well, not everybody, but generally agreed Mount Sinai is. And they went and saw Mount Sinai. And it was just kind of, and they had studied. They, they spent all this time, months leading up to it, reading Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, studying. And they said they saw the mountain. It was kind of, not so much a glorious mountain, but a hill. And it was just kind of unimpressive. And nothing about the topography of the place matched what they were reading. And they were just kind of disappointed by the whole experience. Well, they did a little reading and discovered that not everybody agrees that that's Mount Sinai. That's where the tourists go it's called St. Catherine's Mount Sinai because Catherine went out there and visited and said, this is Mount Sinai. And if Queen says it's Mount Sinai, everybody agrees. Nobody argues with the Queen. And that's where the tourists go, but it doesn't really match. There are, they discovered that there are archaeologists, Bible scholars who have a theory that Mount Sinai is actually in Saudi Arabia. The problem is nobody can get into Saudi Arabia to go looking because Saudi Arabia is an extremely controlled kingdom. Except they lived in Saudi Arabia because they worked for the oil company. And so they went exploring and discovered a place that some people believe is the real Mount Sinai. Now, there's a long story to this. There's a whole little documentary about it. It's really fascinating. What they found is incredible. I want to show you just one of the things they found around Mount Sinai that, they, that is a mountain that is a huge mountain that is black all along the top. They climbed to the top of it. I saw the pictures, and it looks like a cloud up there, like it's cloud covered, but it's not. In bright sunlight, it looks black, and they took some of it. It's burnt on the top. But what I want to show you, that I wish I could get into a long story. I want to stick to this. What I want to tell you is they found a big rock. And now we can bring up the pictures, if they'll come up. They worked before when I wasn't talking about them. Okay, that is a, that's Jim and Penny Caldwell. They're good friends. They, the picture's a little stretched there. I apologize for that. But that's Jim and Penny now. That's actually a more recent photo. But the place where they're sitting, go to the next photo, is a rock that looks like that. Now that rock, if you get, take a little perspective, that rock, the, it's about 200 feet up. And the rock itself is about 40 feet tall. Now, in the Exodus story, it says that Moses struck the rock, but I want to read you from Psalm 78 that tell, retells the same story. Psalm 78 is actually a retelling as they would do at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says, he guided them with the cloud by day and with light from fire all night. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. It says he split the rock, cleaved it, if you have King James. The, uh, the rock they found there is a huge, that's 40 feet tall, and it is split right down the middle. As they walked up close to it, go back a couple of pictures to uh, the picture where they're sitting. If you look up close, they say you get up close, all the rocks in the area are dried out and flaky rocks because there's almost no rainfall in that area. They said rainfall is about half an inch a year 
That's not a lot of rain. But the rock, if you look behind them, is actually smoothed out and scored by water, like high-pressure water. And as you pan out from there, there are there, the, the water, it looks like water has carved out pathways. And down below it, I didn't get a picture from this, but down below it, there are big basins where water would pool up. If you picture a couple million people in the desert, they don't need a water fountain, they need water pools. Because it says they, fed, they, they watered their livestock and they all gathered around. You don't need just one place, everybody get in line. You need water to come out gushing out of the ground. Now, can I say that that rock unequivocally is the same rock? No, I think there was a lot of evidence for it. The stuff they found, I would love to watch. I'll share with you the whole documentary. It's pretty awesome stuff. But I do want to give you this perspective that when God brought waters, he didn't set up a little water fountain for everybody to gather around. It says in Psalm 78, he gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. When you're thirsty and God brings you water, he doesn't give you a trickle. He gives you rivers. God provided rivers of, the wa of water and the people came and they drank. Now, I want to go back to, I wish I could spend more time on that story. It's a really fascinating one. I want to go back to John chapter 7 to show you what happens with Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. They are retelling this story. And each day, the priest would come out with the jug of water. And they would pour it out on the rocks and retell the story. But on the eighth day, look at John 7 at verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. All right, last and greatest day. This is day number eight. For seven days they've gone out. This is the eighth morning where they wake up in tents, go out, and everybody marches around the courtyard once, and, and the priests go in the big procession, and they go down, pick up water from the pool of Siloam, come back, pour out the water. They hear the story again and again, but day eight was different. On day eight, the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam, come back with their pitchers. The people would march around the courtyard seven times because they were remembering that the wandering in the desert ended that God got them through. And the seven times around, they would retell the story of the Israelites making it into the promised land and arriving at Jericho, where they walked, marched around the city seven times. And the walls came down, and they got into the promised land. And on that day, as they remember that the hard times don't last forever. Is that important to remember? That God gets you through? Sometimes he won't get you out, but he will get you through. And on that last day, the priest would take the pitchers and they would turn them over, but no water. They would pour out, but there was no water. And they would say, we remember that God provided in the desert, but we made it through to the promised land. And they would read Isaiah 44, 3, where God promises, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground, I will pour out my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They'd read Isaiah 44, where God promises to pour out water on the thirsty, but more specifically, pour out my spirit. Now that's the context where Jesus stands up and it says in verse 37, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. Now it's interesting. Because rabbis would normally sit, and Jesus would normally sit when he taught. And Jesus, rarely does it say that he shouted. Only a couple times do we hear that Jesus spoke in a loud voice. But here he shouts in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. As the people are watching, as they, they've seen day after day, God provides water in the desert, but on this last day, there's no water. Because God's talking about a different kind of water this time. There is a thirst that is not just your body needing water. There is another kind of thirst. And Jesus said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. You know what kind of thirst I'm talking about? 
You know what spiritual thirst feels like? Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? There is a need of the soul that is stronger than the need of your body for water. Your soul thirsts for God. And we can fill it with all kinds of stuff, can't we? We can try. You can try the spiritual soda. You know what I'm talking about? When, you know when, when the Sprite commercial says, obey your thirst? And those things, that drove me crazy. That drove, Kobe, got, Kobe Bryant comes out and, and he's holding a Sprite. He's like, obey your thirst. And I'm like, is Kobe Bryant one of the great stars of the NBA, idiot enough to fill his, his thirst with sugar and then go try to play a game? I don't think he does that. I don't think he does that. I think they pay him a few bucks to, to, take, to hold up a Sprite and then he goes and drinks water like he's supposed to. <laughs> if you're going to obey your thirst, you don't drink a soda. This is a terrible idea. We went to a, we went on a mission trip to Juarez, Mexico. Juarez, Mexico gets hot. We were building a, a house in Juarez. It was 115 degrees in Juarez, Mexico. And we went to build a house out in the sun. And the people who ran the trip, they told us the story. Now, I'm on my kids every day. We had a group of teenagers, drink water, drink water, drink water. We, they, they told us a story about a youth group that had come to build a house a couple years earlier. And they said the, the youth leaders brought their kids Coca-Cola every day. 115 degree heat and they kept giving them Coca-Cola. And guess what happened? They got sick. They got dehydrated. It's dangerous. And when they figured out what was going on, they got rid of all the Coke. Said, you, need, you can have a Coke at the end of the day for fun. You need to drink water all day when you're out in the heat. You need, your thirst needs some water. Understand that your spiritual thirst needs God. You need the Lord. And you can try to fill it with drugs, sex, money, fun, success, pleasure, fame, religion, Yes, religion can be spiritual soda. Did you know that? That you can try to fill that need with religion, but you're not getting filled because you need God. And the religious guy is just as dry as the guy chasing after success, chasing after money, chasing after sex. That all of it leaves you empty. Some of those things are good. Some of them are bad in and of themselves. None of them satisfy your thirst for God. Jesus says, "If let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Whoever believes in me, believe in Jesus. You come to Jesus, he gives you water. Like real water. You know what water tastes like when you are thirsty, thirsty? You know what? The spirit is like when it hits your soul and your soul is thirsty for God, like deers pant after the water. You ever seen your dog really thirsty? We don't hang out with deers that much, but I've seen my dog really th Have you seen your dog on a hot day when you forgot to fill the water dish and his tongue is hanging down to the ground? <laughs> your soul ever feel like that? Jesus says, rivers of living water will flow from within them that you will be satisfied from within rivers of water like the picture of the rock split in two in the desert when rivers of water came out and first corinthians tells us first corinthians 10 says that that rock was jesus that rock was christ did you know that that rock in the desert that was christ it was a picture and out of him flowed the rock was Christ, the waters were the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. He was promising them something they didn't have yet, the Holy Spirit. Now, does that mean the Holy Spirit just didn't exist before that? Or he wasn't around before that? No, we have stories in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit showed up. We have the Holy Spirit showed up, landed on Jesus like a dove. The Holy Spirit was, was there, but he hadn't filled them. That didn't happen until after Jesus died and rose again. They had the Holy Spirit with them, 
They had the Holy Spirit in them, but it wasn't until later they had the Holy Spirit upon them, filling them, overflowing them like rivers of living water. Verse 40, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, don't call me Shirley, he's the Messiah. <laughs> I was... <laughs> Gail doesn't think it's funny. Mike thinks it's funny. That's all I need. <laughs> others said he's the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. The people were divided because of Jesus. Did you know that's true today right now? That people get divided over Jesus. You can find common ground with anybody in the world somewhere. But Jesus, Jesus divides us. Where do you stand on Jesus? When you get to judgment day, there will be one place of division. And it's about not who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. It's about Jesus. Jesus divides Jesus even said, don't think that I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Now, he came to bring peace to our hearts. But when that happens, when Jesus is in us, the people who don't want Jesus around, it'll divide us. And when you talk about Jesus, you'll find people just kind of, the waters start parting. People, some people go over here, some people go over there. People were divided over Jesus. Some people say he's the prophet, some say he's the Messiah, but then other people say, wait, wait, how can Messiah come from Galilee? He can't come from Galilee. Doesn't the scripture say he's supposed to come from Bethlehem? Now this actually gets back to the argument that we found in the last couple of when Mike was teaching and Robbie was teaching. They were arguing over where the Messiah is supposed to come from. And there were different teachings about it. Some people said nobody, when, G, when the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he's from. Because there are scriptures in the Old Testament that say that the Messiah is from of old. From a, where people, you don't know where he's from. Because he's God, Right? And there are scriptures that say he's from Bethlehem. In fact, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel. It says the Messiah comes from Bethlehem, right? But it also says whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. In the same verse where it says he's from Bethlehem, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. In that same verse, it says his origins are are from ancient times. Not ancient times from our perspective, ancient times from theirs. So the people said, well, I thought he was supposed to be from Bethlehem. Well, wait a second. You say, well, Jesus was from Bethlehem, except he grew up in Galilee, in Nazareth. And the people said, you can't, he, nothing good comes out of Galilee. Galilee was a dark place. And they say, you can't come from Galilee. So the people were divided about it, but if they would look into it, they'd find another verse in Isaiah 9. Remember Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born? Same, ver same chapter says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Don't you love that verse? You know, was, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. That can talk to a lot of us here, but it was talking specifically about the people of Galilee because it was a dark place. There's a reason people said, no way Messiah's coming from Galilee. No way. And when they said Galilee, that was, that, they were like saying Inglewood, Compton. What kind of good comes out of there? If somebody told you that there's this great church in Compton, you say, Compton? Actually, there is. There's a fantastic church in Compton. God's doing a really fantastic work. But most people say, are you kidding? Out of Compton? You know what comes out of Compton? Well, when there's darkness, God shows up with light. And in Galilee, God promised that now people in darkness would see a great light. But they were arguing over it instead of looking into it. If they had just asked, they would find out, oh, Jesus does come from Bethlehem and Galilee. And it satisfies both scriptures. But verse 45, finally the temple guards went back to the chief. You remember earlier in the chapter, the chief priests had sent guards to arrest. If Jesus shows up, arrest him. Well, the guards come back. 
And the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? They didn't arrest him. 46, no one ever spoke the way this man does. The guards replied, you mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. So the The guards go out, they're like, our job, we're going to arrest Jesus. They show up and they hear Jesus. They see him in person. They hear him they say, we can't arrest this guy. Now understand, the life of a guard is to do what you're told. These guys are soldiers. But there comes the point in every soldier's life where you have to recognize that your first allegiance is not just to your commanding officer. And that's what you've been trained. That's what's been built into you. But there comes a point where you realize that your commanding officer has a commanding officer. That there's someone above everyone. And you got to decide who you're going to obey. This was a hard place, if you imagine what these guards were going through. To show up without doing their job. This is dangerous. But they say, no one ever spoke like this guy. And so the, the chief priests, the Pharisees say, what are you talking about? Have any of us, the smart people... Have, have, have any of the leaders believed in this guy? Now, you've got to understand there's a division between, there, there, there's this great divide between the Pharisees who consider themselves the smart ones, the learned ones, the scholars, and then the others were the riffraff. And they say, it's the riffraff believe in him. If, if he was really the Messiah, don't you think we would know? I mean, we're the religious ones. We're the ones who know. And the same thing can happen today. The same thing can happen. Well, how come all the professors at my college are so against Jesus? Aren't they the smart ones? How come, how come all, all the, the smart scientists seem to, they, they don't believe in God? And you know what? That was actually my story. I was in college, and I was a smart kid, and I was like, none of the smart people seem to believe in this God stuff, so it must not be true. Now, I didn't actually look into it. I didn't check it out. But I just kind of went with the, well, as long as the smart people say God's not real, then I guess he's not real. Look what happens. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number. Now, you remember Nicodemus from John chapter 3, who went in hiding at night and talked to Jesus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a religious guy. He's one of them. And Nicodemus went and talked to Jesus himself. Nicodemus isn't a believer yet, but he challenges the other Pharisees and he says to them, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him and find out what he has been doing? He said, you guys haven't even asked him any questions. You haven't even, like, you won't even listen to him and you're writing him off. So they replied to Nicodemus, verse 52, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So they blow off Nicodemus. What are you talking about? Galilee is a dark place. Prophets don't come from there. It can't happen. It's done. Well, funny. It's funny when smart people say, well, if you looked into it, you'd know this. If you did your research, then you'd realize that the Bible's all wrong. If you read the Bible, you'd know that it contradicts itself everywhere. If you, and this is what smart people do, except... (laughs) Except the question is, have they looked into it? If you look into it, you'd see that prophets don't come out out of Galilee. Really? Did you know that Jonah was a prophet and Jonah came from Galilee? He's a prophet. If you look into it, if you dig in, they didn't actually look into it. They just said, if you do, you'd find that we're always right. (laughs) And Capernaum, the, the city of Capernaum means city of Nahum. So we think Nahum probably came from Galilee. But they said, if you look into it, they don't actually want you to look into it. When I was a college kid, I always thought, well, if I looked into it, I just find that they're right anyway. But I finally was convicted. I thought, you know, as a scientist, can I actually say that I've looked into it? I haven't. So how do I know? I've put, does, does science write something off without actually investigating it? So I thought, well, as a scientist, I have to investigate. I went at, into thinking about God without any intention of believing in God. I just thought, I got to be honest, intellectually. I finally gave it a chance and discovered that this evolution I've been holding on to violated the rules of science horrendously. They just push all the violations back to the Big Bang. Something comes from nothing. Energy comes from non-energy. Entropy is in reverse. It violated all my rules of science. But as long as the smart people believed it, I went along. 
And I discovered it had a lot of holes. And this whole God thing explained a lot. So what happens for them? Well, verse 53, then they all went home. Which is how we end the service here. We all go home. I think it's a great way to end the chapter. They all went home. <laughs> but the question is, what are you going to do when you get there? What are you going to do with Jesus? You got to decide whether you believe this or not. We all go home. Are you going to bring Jesus with you? Are you going to try to satisfy your thirst with a soda? It'll leave you empty. <laughs> with something empty. I'm not preaching against Sprite. Well, it is terrible for you. So it is terrible for you. So maybe I should. But <laughs> when you thirst for God, don't try to satisfy it with anything less than Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word. Worship team, come on back up. Lord, we thank you for satisfying the thirst of our souls. That, Lord, you saw us through the desert. That you gave us water. That, Lord, in the hardest times in our lives, I know I can speak for me, and, Lord, I believe that one after another would stand up and testify in this place that, Lord, you met us there. That when everybody argued, is God with us or not, Lord, we know you were with us, that you saw us through. And that, Lord, you reminded us and you taught us in that place that we need you more than water, more than life. And Lord, I pray that all of us here would come to Jesus and find satisfaction for our souls and the filling of the Holy Spirit would quench our thirst and flow out of us like rivers of living water. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song. Amen.